Right. Gorgeous. Well, hello and welcome to the TCL 32 Weekly Sync. And we are getting pretty close to the end. So Fatima, as I mentioned the others, uh, unfortunately, Jonah can join us today. Um, but he's got prior great engagement, but we'll hold, hold the fort down in his absence. Uh, so shall we get started with demos? Who wants to show me, show April what we're looking at here from your wonderful work this week? Uh, yeah, now I can show the application. Fatima, we were kind of talking before. We may have volunteered you to show the code. Are you okay with that? Or yeah, <laughs> just because you it. made the final like, changes and stuff. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I can do it. All right, awesome. Let me uh, get this started. One second. Fantastic! I'm excited to see. Second. What's your dog's name, Jordan? Pepito. <laughs> Let me shut my door. <laughs> yeah, Pepito. <laughs> That's very cute. Please so. tell me it's a massive dog, like a Great Dane or something. And that is yeah. a miniature Bernie Doodle. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> But uh, it's got a loud voice, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Cool. So um, I'm going to use this token here. Does not exist? One second. <laughs> So the changes from the last um, code or issue that we had. Um, so now we have our application that is basically, um, you know, it's storing like the days until the next estimate um, and it's sorting on uh, which ones will like come first, basically uh, by day. And it's categorized it by like uh, soon, um, semi soon, like inactive here on the bottom. Uh, so you can see like what's the, the item that you're going to be purchasing um, the most soon, I guess, uh, first. And within each category, if something had the same uh, days or days estimate until the purchase, uh, then it would be like sort of um, sorted alphabetically. And I think that's uh, I think that's it. Very nice. Did you guys have any particular problems or challenges while doing this week's work? I think, I mean, from the beginning of the week, uh, you know, a lot like actually what we were talking about with April earlier, um, just kind of like sorting it the correct way, right? Because like, you know, first we had like just the query from the database to do it like alphabetically. Um, we had to do like, you know, a couple different changes like parse in uh, just to get it to like an integer to sort. Um, and then, yeah, I think then we had to, I think we went through like actually a couple different like sorting algorithms to get it like correct. Cause it's kind of like a two step like sort, not just like, you know, and we, I guess the biggest thing is we kept it all in one like block instead of like three different or four different lists that I think Stacy was mentioning that other teams were doing. Um, so that's kind of what I saw on my end at the beginning of the week, but uh, does anyone else have anything else? Cool. All right, what? well, thanks for showing. Go when ahead. you add a new item, um, 
that gets mm -hmm. added into the the bottom the gray section correct i believe so let's see yeah Uh, what should we buy? Water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think because it has like a null value um, in day's estimate, uh, it's going to be in inactive. So then I remember in your in your search um, conditionals or your sorting conditionals regarding like the color codes and things like that, that you start at um, greater than or equal to two. Um, on the purchased, which I believe the acceptance criteria indicates that it should be inactive if there's one purchase um, or it's been a long time. So at what point does an item become more than one purchase? Like if I was to purchase water today, would it stay gray or would it move up the next time? Like when does it enter your, that's just me being curious. That's, that's not yeah, a no. judgment on. I don't know if anyone in the group has the answer. I guess off the so. Top when you add head, it to the list, it doesn't get considered purchased. Is that correct? No. So only when you actually check it will it uh, fill in like the last purchase and whatnot. Okay. So the checkbox like kicks off that purchase logic. So if we see water, so we checked it off. Now it has like the now last purchase one. of today. Okay. By the. Um, so the next time I purchase it is when it would start to get sorted into those top categories. Right, I guess, because days until next purchase is still zero. So yeah, let's just say we did like two. Okay, so now two. Yeah, it's hard to get like a valid like testing scenario because yeah. Kind yeah. of takes into account like all these different ones but yeah if we put it the two and then change the date and then check it off one more time now you're kind of at like a valid scenario would it be like not yeah. or semi soon so yeah that's yeah. not a that's not a critique onto your guys's work because you guys have followed the acceptance criteria um i just find that curious why they have it set that way i feel like right. when you add it to the list did you give it a soon kind of soon that it should drop into those categories and then if you don't purchase it ever Mm -hmm. or within a period of time or something. I don't know, but that's just. No, it's true. If you put it to your list. That's just a almost... general thought and a general observation. And again, you guys, have, you guys have hit the acceptance criteria exactly as expected. So that was me just being curious. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a, yeah, definitely a valid point. We'll write it in the backlog, you know, maybe some yeah. <laughs> improve in version 2.0. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Cool, cool. Anything awesome. else? Great, great. One little hack that I do when I'm one little hack that I do when I'm testing your guys is because you have your days till next purchase or since last purchase set up as a calculation. Um, is instead of having it set up as 24 hours, as I go in and set it up, it's like 15 seconds. <laughs> oh wow! That's and then good, good hack. And then it cycles through a lot faster. <laughs> Rather than yeah. going into the database and manipulating that way. No, I wish I thought of that sooner. You know? <laughs> <laughs> then you just have to remember to, to change that back before you push. So be careful oh, yeah, with that tactic. <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, Fatima, do you want to share the code? Yeah, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen fine? Yep. Okay. So in the uh, item component, we um, added styling to the input. Oh no, the list, the list item here. Mm -hmm. So the checkbox style, um, we had conditional styling based on if it's the days and purchase is less than two. And mm -hmm. it is or between two and seven. Uh, the next one is between eight and 30. 
and then next one is greater than 30, and then inactive. And then same conditionals for the RE label. And we'll probably switch it to the that switch statement that you showed us before. Yeah. This will a lot, definitely a lot um, easier to read that way. Great. So and curious, then, the difference between greater than 30 and does inactive get an actual, so it does actually have like a, a where it specifically says inactive or how is that categorized? Um, Cause it's sorting it correctly. So I'm just curious like what it's sorting off of for that. Is it a number or is, cause the, uh, you have the, your um, conditional set up as did I the switch, which is that your default, uh, meaning if it doesn't hit true on any of these other conditionals, then put it as an active and gray at the bottom. Um, which would cover the zero and one purchases. So how does it pick up the inactive? Actually, I didn't really think about that because I, I added, before we didn't have um, this greater than 30 uh -huh. and the light yellow. Uh, but I'm not really sure how, um, or I didn't really think it through yet how, because it actually does it cor incorrect, correctly in the code. How do you mean? Or uh, when when uh, we demo it, uh, the items that are greater than 30 are um, different from the active state, I think. Because what Jordan just showed us, there were like three or four items at the bottom that were gray. And I'm assuming that that's because they fall into the category of inactive or is that, or are they falling into the category of having been purchased less than two times? There's two criteria there. So one would be, it hasn't been purchased in twice the amount of time. My cat's on the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, sorry, I'm finding my thought again. Inactive means, yeah, uh, less than two purchases, right? Or it hasn't been purchased in twice the amount of time it was anticipated. Correct. Okay. So is that happen? That's, ha that's checked then within your, I, I guess I'm, I'm just curious how it's picking that up. Cause let's just say for the sake of argument that the the days since last purchase is 35 days and that is well over the two weeks of when it was expected to have been purchased mm -hmm. so what makes the distinction between it being light yellow and being light gray within like how are you making that distinction so i think my understanding is that uh, whatever is greater than 30, but still active, still an active item is going to be yellow. And then inactive would be any of the items that were, have less than two purchases. Or the days of um, days since purchase times two is less than the days until next purchase. Okay. Let's 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 continue with the code. We'll go into your sort algorithm and and we'll see if we can like piece it all together as we go through okay. that. Yeah. Okay. So I think um, for this file, this is the only changes we made, just adding the style okay, and the aria label. And um, in item list, we, um, I think this is a line that sorts the um, items from the database by alphabetical order, mm -hmm. by item name normalize. And then um, in this section here, we're sorting the rest of the items uh, based on the states. So first, um, we have a 
calculation here to check if an item is active. Um, so uh, first we check that the, um, or if the, so if the item is uh, the days since purchase of the item times two is uh, less than the days until next purchase, uh, which is which is a number from the calculate estimate mm -hmm. function, or the number of purchases is um, greater than one, then it's active. And then uh, here is the compare function in the sort. So first we check if um, the two items being compared are either both active or both inactive. Mm -hmm. And then we compare their days until, uh, we subtract uh, the days until next purchase minus the, of one item to, or minus the days until purchase of the other item. And then for all the other cases where one is active and the other one is inactive, then it's either uh, going to return negative one or one. Okay. Which which would then show why it would jump into the inactive status because you would set it to an a value that is lower than two which would push it to the bottom, which is the light gray. Correct? Yeah. Yeah, that might be something to pursue, is to look to see if you have an item that is inactive, and again, this might be a little bit harder to connect and put together with the database, but that it's inactive, but also greater than 30 days. And just see if it sorts the way you expect it to. Yeah, I think you know, um, I'd have to like, actually like put like the, the items uh, or test it with a lot of different items. Mm -hmm. Because it's hard to, for me to, right now to like wrap my head around um, those two last conditions right now. Mm -hmm. Well, if you if you look think about it in res re, um, in respect to the switch statement that I had uh, suggested, you are looking to see which of the conditions checks to be true first. So if you go back to that statement there. So even in this case, you're checking to see if it's between two and seven. And if not, then it checks between if it's between eight and 30. And if not, it checks mm -hmm. to see if it's more than 30. And so at that point, if it is now false as well, it will then go and check that it'll default down to the inactive. So the, the question that I'm wanting to make sure that you've covered is when this first section here is true because it's greater than 35, how does it then fall and get caught as inactive? I think the way it is now, I'm not really sure if it's catching that. I feel like for this last conditional, we would have to add something else to this line. Yeah, um, it may be that you somehow need to. Yeah, I'm not sure, but that's what I'm. That's what I was when I was going through and setting up the switch statement. That was the one piece that I wasn't able to answer, and then and then I ran out of time before the meeting started. So that's why I bring it up here too. Um, is that that something that you guys you might want or need to look into to figure out um, if that if that case is in fact actually being met. Okay, yeah, I, I get it. Okay. All righty, well, thank you for showing us your changes.
I think we've kind of gone gone through it qu in quite a good amount of detail. So I, are we okay moving on? We are, yes. And by the way, really good job. Sorting is tricky and it's confusing and it can and it can be a challenge. So um, the work that you guys have put up is really good work. So this is just the fine tuning and making sure the edge cases are covered as well. Thank you. All right. I think that's right. me again. You guys are going to listen to me yak a lot today. Sorry. <laughs> All right. We have our, I think this is our last learning module because next week y'all get to show us your awesome final product. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, okay. Let's get zoom out of my way here. All right. So communication for devs is the topic for this uh, learning module. And uh, in this one, we're going to really talk about, you know, the different ways of communication and how we communicate to one another as dev and the fact that it is really key in a team environment um, that the communication be strong. And um, so we're going to go through different, the different ways in which we communicate with one another. And so this first one here, the what is the documentation. And documentation can be anything from documenting the actual, like you, what you would read if you were using a library or a framework or something like that, all the way down to just documenting internal processes and um, actions that take place on a team. Um, so the why is documenting what did I do again um, so that you know what you did so that the next time you need to do it, you have a reference and that you can share that reference with others. Um, writing things down does help you learn. It helps to solidify the concepts. Um, it's also a really great tool for revisiting big decisions. So if a big decision has been made and then a little bit later there's some questions about it, it's really nice to go back to that original documentation and remember why you made the choices you made. Um, it's so useful for onboarding new team members. Um, when you can, especially with a lot of companies working remote, either part or full time, um, being able to have the documentation for a new team member to get up and running and answer as many of their questions as possible through written um, and searchable context is really helpful to both them and the team. It also avoids from having institutional knowledge, meaning that one person knows all of that information. And if that person's unavailable or leaves the company, um, the rest of the team is in a really big bind. And so ensuring that you have that knowledge documented in a place that is accessible and uh, known by others um, eliminates that risk. And then it empowers all team members um, because you're all on the same page, you're all working with the same information. So the how, quick tips, write for the person who knows the least. So when you're documenting something, really try to avoid the presumption of knowledge where you can. Um, it's, I find that to be my biggest frustration when I go through documentation for um, code bases or um, libraries and things is that there is a lot of presumed knowledge that if you're coming in as a newer person, you don't have yet. And so then trying to weave your way through the words when you don't have that knowledge can be really challenging. Um, but you do want to optimize it for the person who needs a quick reference. And that can be done with the formatting. So while you're adding that additional information, if you format it in a way that's easy to peruse and, and go through, then the person who does have that context can skip through and get to the pieces that they need quicker. And um, so then we do have an example here. And I just opened that in a new tab, but I forgot I'm only sharing one tab. So that's not great. All right, I'll come back to it in a moment because I'm not sure which tab that opened. <laughs> All right, so the next way that we communicate is through pull requests. And you guys have done this already. So you have a good sense and um, uh, understanding of kind of what it, what it is. Um, so the why that we do it, it gives reviewers the context of your code so that when they come into it, they know what they're looking for and looking at. Um, a big part of interviewing is talking and walking through code. So having a robust PR description helps you remember what you did. So when even when you're putting up 
your own work in your own repos for your own project, it's a really good process and um, practice to actually open a pull request and describe what you're doing and what you're adding to your project before merging it, merging it into your main branch. And that way you have documentation for not only yourself, but for others. And if you're asked to go back and look at some of your projects, you have that as a reference that you can um, look at and, and kind of jog your, jog your memory. And then how? Um, you can really shine on a pull request using things and tools like screenshots, GIFs, and videos. Um, you've seen me do that before, particularly with the voiceover work so that you can see what I'm seeing. And it just makes it a really clear and easy way to give a concrete example of what you're pointing out. So the screenshot that shows the button that's misaligned, um, the GIF that shows the item that's flashing when you change the screen, um, whatever the case may be, it's really, really helpful to the original author to be able to go back and see exactly what you did so they know what they're looking for when they try to replicate it. Um, links to resources and permalinks to code you reference is also very helpful. Um, if you're giving examples of something that, you know, uh, there's another part of the code where we do the same procedure, maybe you could use that function here as well, give a link to that so that they can get to it quicker and easier. Um, Self-review before asking others to review your code. This one is kind of a personal request for my own sanity. I love, I, I really do try to go through after I've put my stuff up and make sure that I've removed all my console logs, um, made sure that my comments are accurate. Um, just kind of look through it first before I then tag anybody for reviewing it because I know that reviewing takes time away from the work that they're trying to get done too. And so the easier that I can make it for them, the better it goes for everybody. Um, try to keep your PR small and narrowly scoped. Um, really avoiding that scope creep of, oh, while I'm in this code here, I can go ahead and fix this other piece. If it's not directly related to the issue that you're working on, it's really best to open a new issue and a new, um, uh, a new PR with that work, even though it's in the same section of code. It just keeps it easier and cleaner to review from a reviewer standpoint when you're only dealing with um, one issue at hand. And then examples for great PR descriptions are there as well. <laughs> um, and again, I can try to open these. There we go, I'll just open it direct and then we'll go back. Um, so this one here is connecting the app to the Firebase. So you guys are familiar with this one, just because this is from this exact app that we did. Um, they documented that it's a new feature and that it updates dependencies. And then they put the acceptance criteria, marking which ones were completed, as well as the issue that it related to, and a full description, giving exactly kind of what they did, um, why they did it, and then the steps that are needed in order to go through to test it as well as you know, any to-dos for last minute circumstances. Um, so it feels like maybe this is really wordy for the amount of work that I did, but as a reviewer, it's really nice to just know what your thought process was, what you were attempting to have done with the work that you did, and then being able to evaluate whether or not that actually is what's happening, what you're seeing, and if there's any improvements that you might suggest. Okay. And then the other communication comments in code, the what, why, and how of that. So what, the why, sorry, it gives your team more context while they're actively tracing through code that you implemented. Um, so leaving a comment to just let them know, you know, kind of this is taking advantage of this new library because of these reasons. So that way when they start reading through that code, they have a reference point and a context to base it off of. And then code can in some ways be self-documenting, but the decision behind the code is not always self-apparent. So writing a comment when you need to document the decision um, behind what you did is important because the code itself will tell them what you did, but the why isn't always obvious. And I think we can kind of, the, the parse it might've been a good example where a code, uh, a comment right above that to state something to, to the effect of, given that the database returns um, items 
at with a really long uh, timestamp, the taking this into a, a direct integer makes it easier to sort. And that way the why of what you did makes sense um, when you're reading it. And then, so the how is then is to focus on the why the code was written rather than what the code does. Um, in that example that I just gave, I know what parse int does, but I wasn't sure why we were doing it because I knew that the estimated calculation returned a number um, already, but I didn't realize you know, the, the difference that it returns in regards to the decimal points and how that affected this, the sorting that you were trying to do. And then a great example of a comment. Um, so we've got this multiple and it has checks to see if it's an array. Um, and then given the default index and then the true or false it returns a default index or an array with the index inside it. Um, so this says if multiple is set to true, we need to make sure the default index is an array and vice versa. We'll handle console warnings in our prototypes, but this will at least keep the component from blowing up. Um, so that's an example of the reason I'm doing this is instead of just figure it out based on what I did. All right, so with that said, um, we can talk about what your experiences have been with both the documentation, descriptions, comments, et cetera. So this in terms of the project today or just like in general like either way in general but definitely our project um i think you know as you know with being collab lab our main focus and intention is to help you learn collaborative skills and a big part of collaborating is communicating so <laughs> many of the skills that are were discussed there are you know highly relevant to the work you've done with collab lab but feel free to talk about experiences outside of that yeah just like i mean just like one thing that popped into my head first, like I guess outside of this project, um, I had the opportunity to kind of shadow like front end engineering group at Zapier. Um, and I kind of, that was like, I ended up opening like a pull request um, and making like a small change on the website. But uh, the issue was kind of like, you know, when you talked about uh, the documentation, like in a, uh, like a repo, like it wasn't like that good right and like they kind of used me as like a test as well so it was kind of good it, you know kind of went both ways like they kind of like gave it to me and said like try to get it set up and then i went back with like a bunch of questions because like you know the <laughs> kind of documentation of how to get it set up, up like wasn't you know clear you know for kind of like a junior dev you know yeah. um so it, they you know kind of were appreciative they like updated that um so but it just shows like yeah like if you're at like a, a different level, you know, it's, mm -hmm. and you don't understand like what they're talking about, like you, sometimes you can't even get the repo like working, you know, so. Yeah, the implied knowledge That's is a important. big thing. It's a big hurdle that I've run into a number of times um, in my, mm -hmm. you know, my earlier through, through even today. <laughs> um, you know, I'm only two years, just under two years into my career um, and only about four years into learning to code. So still, still a baby in some ways. Uh -huh. And, um, and so that's still a hurdle that I, that I bump up against, particularly with, um, documentation on libraries and, and mm -hmm. repos and stuff where there's just a lot of implied knowledge, um, that the writer doesn't think. Right. About, they just know it. <laughs> is it, or yeah it was more like oh we like assumed everyone already had this set up mm -hmm. or like this installed yeah. or this you know like uh not the authorization but yeah just like you know yeah. i mean like everything already like ready to go um outside of just like npm start you know but yeah yeah so. and even something as simple as you know ensure that you have npm installed on your machine here's a link to the documentation for npm like you don't have to tell me how to right. do it but you need to let me know mm -hmm. that I need to know to do it. <laughs> exactly. You know, exactly. I mean, that, that's a, but yeah. So, you know, that's a great example and, and good for you for updating this document. And the next person yeah, will thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I had a follow-up question then for you folks, which is just that we've been doing this all remotely and I'm not sure if you guys have any office experience while working as developers. I was just kind of curious what your thoughts would be. How does communication differ from an in-office working experience to a remote working experience? 
I've never worked in an office, like ever. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, well, I guess the other the kind of caller question is which one do you think is harder? Is it easier to communicate in an office environment, easier to communicate remotely? What are your thoughts? I guess it remotely. depends on the situation. Like I think like working on or trying to figure out a problem, um, it might be easier to like work um, directly with people. But then when you're doing just work, like adding features or something, um, I think remote is a good way to do it. I think in person could have the pitfall of not documenting because you are near each other. Absolutely. Yeah. I would agree with that 100%. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, just go ask Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then everybody goes and asks Paul, and nobody ever writes it down. <laughs> And then Paul leaves the company and yeah. it's like, oh, wait, why do we make those choices again? <laughs> and there's no paper trail. So, yeah. yeah. So. Where I, I think that, re go ahead. I was going to say, where I work, it's, uh, it's always been remote since day one. So they're really sticklers about not having, you know, if you do have a conversation in Slack, you need to like go make a note. Per our conversation, we decided X, you know, in some more lasting form. Um, and then to the point where our DMs actually get wiped out because I think they so badly needed to stop people from doing that. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> I like it. Yeah, that was a habit that I, my... I'm sorry, what? go ahead, Graham. Oh, I was just going to say to pretend to answer my own question, I think actually in theory it should be equally difficult. It's just that we get lazy when we're doing in-person communication. And I think, Mandy, you kind of hit the nail on the head there by saying that we just don't write things down. And we just say, oh, go ask Paul. Yeah. I think there is a, is a good point about Slack, though, because I know that I have been, um, I have found myself having to pull out an old Slack thread to answer somebody's question and realizing I should have copied that information over into that pull request so that it was documented in a public environment. I, you know, it was fine that the conversation took place over Slack, but the decision that was had at the end of it should have been communicated over to say, you know, as per Slack conversation, here's the decision that was made um, and why, so that it would have been documented. So after having gotten kind of hit with that one, I'm a little more conscientious of if any decisions are made in Slack that they get transferred to a public location. <laughs> Awesome. Any more thoughts, April? No, other than just keep on, you know, doing what you guys have been doing really great with your um, pull requests and your descriptions of your work and stuff. So um, just, you know, as you move forward, uh, as I said, the one tip that I would give you is that as you move forward and you, you know, start applying for jobs and you're in that in-between zone, if you continue to work on your own projects, um, I encourage you to do it as pull requests and so that you can keep that practice and keep that experience and have that reference when you need it. I have one question before we go. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about using like a to-do kind of comment? Because they like there are... Um, ES code extensions that will like highlight them for you and, and mm -hmm. you can do like a command to list all of your to do's. I find that to do's tend to get added to code and then die if they don't get associated with an actual issue that was written up. And so I the to me the most useful to do's that I've seen are um, we need this should be refactored to account for xyz and here's the link to the issue so that the next person that comes through sees that the work needs to be done but that there is an actual issue that can be tracked and prioritized um, otherwise it will probably just live there forever until somebody bumps into it and has 100 <laughs> percent and then it saves them the effort of going to get hub and open up new pr because one is already open i like that yeah, uh, the part that I really like about writing those little to-dos is usually when the code doesn't really make sense and there's a reason it doesn't make sense and there's an issue somewhere. 
So the to do, here's what actually needs to happen here, issue link, right? And maybe there's some reason, maybe there's a technical obstacle or there's just not available time or whatever the reason is, it can't be done just yet. Um, but that to do is really important to help explain, hey, we're not idiots. Here's the thing that we're supposed to be doing. We know it, it's just look at this issue and it'll tell you the details. Huh. Thank you. Yeah, I recently was uh, the person beating the drum on one that we had in our code base. It was something to the effect of this should get removed eventually. And it had been there for three years and we were making changes in the code in that exact spot. And so my argument was, three years is eventually right <laughs> because if we don't do it now the likelihood that we'll touch this section of code and this process of routing again is probably another three years away so let's just figure this out now do we need this route um so that's what i mean when they they just kind of perpetually live because there was no issue attached <laughs> So I'm going to pull us a little over our end time, um, so because it is on the hour now. Um, but let's just talk very briefly about issues. So you guys have currently 12 and 13, the sorting as well as the app looking professional and welcoming as your two assigned issues. And you already have MRs open for both. So kind of my, my question for you is, what do you want to do this week? There's one more um, bug issue that April filed but what are your plans? You still got a week of work to continue making the app look professional and welcoming and kind of finishing up your project. What are your thoughts? What do you want to do? I think we need to meet up tomorrow night and <laughs> make a plan, but mostly I think we should focus on styling. Yeah, I think, yeah, just knock out like, the final sorting bug issues or, you know, questions we kind of went through today, tomorrow. Um, we already, I think, uh, yeah, Fatima set up like tailwinds. So I think we're ready to start like, you know, styling so we can divvy up like the different components, um, and tackle that. Do you have a game plan in regards to like your mood board or general like feel that you want for the app or some examples like how far have you guys gotten on any of that yeah i don't think we've uh done a mood board yet so i think tomorrow will be kind of big meeting with the whole team to <laughs> it doesn't to be a formal sense. board but yeah. i but i do think that you'll that you'll want to walk away from tomorrow with a good sense of what the app will look and feel like. Because if you're, especially if you're gonna go off and each do different components, you wanna make sure you're on the same page, um, like have set like color themes and font styles and you know all of your basics and, and a general feel of what mm. you want the app to be um, in regards to, is it professional? Is it whimsical? Is it, you know, you need a feel for what you're going for. And I think that you should definitely like all be on the same page with that. Otherwise you'll end up with a very disparate looks with a general connection. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. If we, it would probably be wise if we rely on some global settings, kind of reduce, you know, discrepancies between colors or font weight, you know, little stuff. Yeah, I, I generally on, um, especially like on a, on a smaller scale application, um, we'll set up like a global CSS that has like the HTML body. And underneath all of that is my H, my all of my H1, 2s, 3s, what I want their weights to be, um, you know, my, my standard text for the whole document, um, you know, for the whole application. If, the, if I'm bringing in a Google font, uh, font style, then I'll, you know, set that as my global font, et cetera, so that yes, so that as you go through, a lot of that will just be taken care of. Um, but yeah, if you look at the links off of um, item or issue 13 for mood boards, you'll see that oftentimes there is like a color palette and um, you know, the, the font styles, et cetera, that are usually determined within that as well. Yeah, yeah I think we can start like a create a mood board and then we can just all like just start putting ideas and anything um like that's like inspiring to us or colors and our fonts that we think will be good into it all right 
So my quick follow-up question is, does issue 14, 13, excuse me, encapsulate all the work that you want to do? Is there more than what's there? And if so, should you create other, other issues that you want to file with regards to the work that you want to do? Uh, I think, I mean, I personally think we're kind of already like running up against the clock, so probably not too many new issues or requests that we want to like throw in there, but. Understood, cool. Well, let us know how we can help you. Uh, if you do run so. into things that you know you'd like to get to, but you know that you can't get to them maybe by next week's final demo is you can still write the issues. And then after the cohort is over, mm -hmm you can go back through and make those changes um, and you know continue to communicate with one another and get those last little details wrapped up if, if they're things you definitely feel like you'd like to have. Okay, yeah, that's a great point. Or we're gonna fork it into even, your own. Even if you... Go ahead, Jim. I was just gonna say also, if you don't actually even intend to do them, having this nice list of things that you want to get done in reality, not just like eight crazy fantastical things, but saying like, I want to improve this, I want to improve this, and I want to improve this. That's also a great thing to come back to in an interview because you're saying, hey, we made this thing. Here's all the things that we still would like to do. We didn't get time to ever do them, but you know, we still have these plans of where we wanted to take it. That's also a great discussion point. I think some of the logic could be encapsulated a little bit better or extracted into like helper files. Mm -hmm. Definitely, that's been bothering me since the beginning. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a great issue to file. And if you get time to get to it, even better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know you said you're under the gun, but if you happen to have extra time, then great, you can pull them off or do them in the future or never do them at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's an excellent point that Graham makes because you know it's a very common thing in production of here's what we want to build and here's the things that we have to put at the bottom of the priority list and we hope we can get there <laughs> and sometimes you do and sometimes you don't but you at least wrote it down so that if you can get there at some point you get there the other thing to me as an interviewer what it would demonstrate would be hey i've got bigger vision than just this the example prototype my vision is larger and you know, I can see exactly how I want it to get, how I want to get this app to that vision. So if you give me your vision, I'll be able to help break that down and figure out what steps need to be taken and work as your engineer. Cool. All right. Okay, well, unless there's anything else from anybody. I hear cricket, so that's nope. gonna take that as a no. Uh, cool. Thank you, you for your time today. Graham, do you remember who has? You. Yes. Do you remember who has office hours this week? Is it me again? I believe it's you. I believe it is yes, me as well. According to uh, Jonah's Slack message. Perfect. Um, I will try to put up office hours towards. Well, this is Thanksgiving week in the U.S., so um, which I think everybody here but Graham is U.S. right. Um, so I will, I think I can probably get office hours in on Tuesday evening, if that works for you all. Um, I know I can do Wednesday. I just don't know what your guys' availability for that would be. So I'll post that out in the channel either later today or first thing tomorrow. Sounds good. All right. Cool. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks all. See you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.